Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming despite the rain. Um, speaking of that, we uh, realized that there is a huge drop in attendance in the tutorials. Uh, it's actually quite common that towards the end of the course, the numbers, the attendance numbers, both in the lecture and the tutorials go down. But this year in the tutorials, it's an extreme drop in attendance. And uh, the other thing that is different this year than previous years is that the midterm exam was pretty bad. It was much worse than previous years. And the only other thing that changed from the course is the practicals. And the practicals are now even more related to the course. So you should, uh, if that has an influence at all, then it should have a positive inf influence on the exam. So the only relation that I see here is the attendance of tutorials and the drop in uh, and the yeah the drop in the attendance and the drop in the grading. So um, be reminded that the tutorials are part of the exam and doing the exercises is a good exam preparation. So this cartoon, when you read it now, it's funny, but if you have to read it again next year, I'm pretty sure you will not laugh that much. All right, so let's start with the actual content. Last, uh, last time we talked about uh, shading. So we said if we have uh, a light source, for example, we have here a light and that uh, shines down here and then it gets reflected here. So we have here an eye vector in our viewing direction and we have a light vector that's coming from the light here. Then we talked about how we can calculate that and how we can create a realistic uh, color on this particular spot. Now, the uh, <coughs> and, and we called this the, uh, the uh, direct directed light because I said, uh, in fact, usually I don't even draw the lamp because I just draw the vector because I said it just depends on the direction of the light. It doesn't depend on the position of the light, which is why in my sketches here, I usually don't draw the lamp. This time I've drawn the lamp on purpose because if you think about what happens when you look now with your eye or with your camera towards a position here at the ceiling, you see that there is no light coming in that direction from the lamp. But we all know from reality that if you turn on the light in the room, usually the ceiling doesn't stay completely dark, but it gets also a little light and that light comes from the light that is reflected from the floor, from the walls and from the other objects that are in the room. And so the point is we need some sort of global illumination when we want to create a realistic image. And uh, this is an example where we compare one image that was created just by direct lighting and the other cr cr uh, created by global lighting. And you see here, for example, the right one looks much more realistic, of course. For example, you see here that you here have shadows with really hard, strict borders, whereas this here looks much more realistic because the shadow doesn't, isn't cut off at a specific point, but just goes smoothly from shadow to light. And also, if you look at the ceiling here, you see that uh, this here on the left side, you basically have the very same color everywhere. Whereas here, you also have light shadows here. But also you see that the ceiling has kind of a little reddish shine. And that comes, of course, from the floor because the color from the floor is also reflected onto the white or gray ceiling. And that way it looks a little more reddish when you want to have it a little more realistic. So this is what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about global illumination. We want to talk about shadows in the second part then after the break. So let's talk with global illumination and uh, I hope you remember that we already had a first approach on this which was more like a heuristic or a hack where we said uh, which we called the ambient lighting where we basically took our shading uh, our grow shading model and the, uh, our Lambertian shading model and then extended it by adding a constant factor here. Oh by the way I forgot to say this uh, the chapter on uh, on global illumination is uh, not in the book. There is a chapter in the book about global illumination, but they do it a little different than I do it here. And also the part on shadows is not in the book, but I will post some references on the people who are interested in more background information on the website. And uh, for the others, uh, I think the, the slides, uh, the lecture notes should be enough information for you to understand it. Um, but that's also why I put a little more text on the slides, so don't be confused if I'm skimming through the slide and you're not done with reading. I put a little more text here so you have a little more information when you repeat it and, and uh, prepare for the exam. 
Good, yeah, so ambient lighting, I don't have to go into that because we, we already discussed this last time, but of course it has obvious limitations. Um, for example, if you take something, if you take an object and move it to a, a very bright object, usually color from that object is reflected and makes this object that you move closer also lighter. And that is of course not considered with ambient lighting. And also uh, the so-called color bleeding does not cure. Color bleeding is the, uh, the technical term for the transfer of color between objects and uh, the light that is reflected by them, which yeah, is basically what, uh, what I just described earlier. So we want to have a more, yeah, better mathematical model, a better way to calculate the, the global illumination. And one very popular approach for this is the so-called radiosity. Now to explain this or to explain the basic idea, let's look at the, a simple example here. Here we have, you see we have a room here with three windows. And inside of this room, uh, it's very hard to recognize at the data projector, sorry for that, but uh, yeah, you have to download the slides later. Then you will see that inside of these rooms here, there are two pillars, one and another one. And in this one, you see already here, one, one is enlightened. So the question is now, how does the light that is outside of this room fall into this room? So let's, and, 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 and light this room. So let's assume we have a light here. So for example, the sun is here. So the light should kind of shine in like this and then put some light on the pillars, not on the top, because of course the windows block the direct way of the light to the pillars. So on top they should be dark, but then the rest of the room should be enlightened. And um, what we do now with, with radiosity, um, for radiosity we usually don't talk about light, but we talk about energy, the transfer of energy, because radiosity has its uh, origins in the uh, thermal heat transfer, which is the, the uh, the study of the emission and reflection of heat and of course light is a special sort of heat and uh, the other difference is that uh, for radiosity we we do not follow the light uh, as an ray but we follow the we, we consider the light uh, with relation to so-called patches so we take our model and split it in patches and then we calculate the light that is falls into this patch or the energy that falls onto this patch and also the energy that is reflected from this patch. So um, <clears throat> the radiosity itself is, itself is defined, uh, the radiosity of a patch is defined as the amount of energy that leaves that patch at a specific, uh, specific time or at a concrete uh, time unit. Um, and uh, yeah, you can think about this as the, the brightness of the patch. And if you think about it, how, how is this brightness influenced? Of course it is influenced. If it is a light source, then it is influenced by the kind of light that you put there. But also, if it is an object, it is influenced by the light that is reflected from that object. So what we're doing in radiosity is we're not dealing with explicit light sources, or we're not distinguishing between objects that reflect light and light sources that uh, emit light, but we see every patch as a potential light source because every patch can emit light in this global illumination, either it because it is a light source or because it reflects light from another light source. Good. So if we look at this uh, view from a pet uh, from this from one of these pillars now, so let's assume we have this this uh, one of the patches here up on top. If we look into the room, if this pa uh, patch is here at the top, you see that the light, if the sun is here a little bit to the left, it will not see the sun. So there is no direct connection between the light and the sun. So when we draw, so the view that the patch has is completely dark. So no light comes in, so no light can be reflected. So that patch stays dark. Now, if we look at the patch that is a little bit deeper, that patch sees probably from here a little bit of the sunlight. So this patch sees a little bit of light here, so it gets a little bit enlightened. And of course, the deeper we go on the pillar, the more direct connection we have to the sunlight, so the more, so the lighter our 
pillars, our patches on the pillar sketch, so we can calculate how the color of the, pitch of the patch looks like. And the same, of course, not only for the pillars, but also for the floors. And then you see here, this is the light when you model it in a way that just the direct sunlight that is on, falls on the floor and on the pillars is considered. This is the kind of image that you get. But now we said, of course, we also want to consider the reflection of the pillars of these uh, patches, of the light on these patches. So what we, what we do now is we say, or if, if we look at, again, at this image before where we had this one patch, that couldn't see any light at all. This patch now has this image where, of course, he sees the light that is shining on the floor and here partly on the wall. So this patch sees some light. And if this light is reflected, then of course, this patch also gets some light. So we consider these patches as an additional light source. And then we add them up, the energy or the light that is transmitted by them to this particular patch. And then, of course, the patch gets lighter. So you see here this patch here on top yeah, you probably don't see it. <laughs> but uh, if you look at the slides then on your computer, you see that here it is a little light gray on the top. And then, of course, so, so you get more light into the room, more patches get enlightened. And if more patches get enlightened, of course, there is more light there. So other patches that haven't seen light before now see light. So you go through it, the whole process again. So this is the second iteration, then the third iteration, and then the fourth iteration, you see it gets, in each step, it gets lighter because every time more light gets reflected and gets reflected until the light that is reflected or the change from the light that is reflected is so small that there are no more changes or the changes are so small that you say, okay, this is pretty much the, the realistic image that I, that I have or the natural image, the realistic version of it that, that I have. So we can basically stop with this uh, recursive calculation of it. And this is basically the idea of radiosity. So you see it is an iterative process, which is why it is slow and you cannot do it in real time rendering, but uh, you could, for example, do it in a pre-processing step and then consider the, the, the light, uh, consider the, the results in a real time rendering program. Because if, for example, the global lighting conditions don't change, of course, you can do it in a pre-processing step and then you have it in your scene. Good, so as I said, this is the uh, basic uh, general idea of radiosity. And now, of course, we're interested in how to implement that, how we can model this with, um, how, uh, with uh, how we can we describe it in a mathematical way so we're able to implement it. And for this, we take this so-called uh, radiosity equation, which is an equation that calculates the ra radiosity, um, as the name they uh, probably implies. So we call the radiosity of a particular patch E, we call B, uh, uh, a patch I, we call B I. Uh, no, we call the radiosity of a patch A I, B I. B I is the radiosity of the patch A I. And um, if you think about what you, what this radiosity is or how you can get it, if you have a patch here, then of course, if the patch is a light source, then this light from this light source has to be considered for the radiosity. So we denote the energy that a patch emits, which is the light it emits with EI. So we have a factor EI here. This is our patch. And then we emit this light or this energy because it's a light source or an energy source. But also we have other patches that have radiosity that, radiosity that they are emitting. And this radiosity, of course, hits our, our, our patch here. So we have, for example, here coming in uh, a radiosity BJ. And then this is, of course, also reflected here. But of course, depending on the material of the patch, not all the radiosity is reflected but it depends on what kind of surface we have. And we do this by using this so-called reflect, reflecti reflectivity factor rho, which is uh, dependent on the patch. So we have the index i here, rho i, which is multiplied with this incoming radiosity. And this is then what goes out here. So actually, no, that's not right here. The outgoing part is called, is multiplied with b. J, of course. Okay, and uh, of course we have to do this not only with this 
patch PA, BJ, but we also have to do this with all the other patches that we have here that can potentially uh, emit light to this particular patch. So what we'd have to do here is we have to make the sum over J, which uh, where J is the index over all the patches. And you see here in this formula, we have this, that we consider here the energy that the patch emits itself. And we also consider the radiosity that is emitted by, uh, that is reflected from the other patches, depending in, in, in an intensity that depends on the surface. But now you see we also have another factor, Fij. And this factor is a dimensionless factor and it's called the form factor from patch Ai to Aj. And if you think about it, what we considered here, um, or, or if you think about what we're modeling here, we're modeling how much energy is coming in and getting reflected, but how much energy is coming in, of course, not only depends on how much energy this other patch is emitting, but it also depends on how his direction is, because if you only, if you tilt it, of course, the energy that gets reflected or the light that gets reflected becomes less than if you have a straight look at it. Also, if it's very far away, then the influence of the light on the reflected object is not as much. And this is modeled with this so-called form factor. Now, the form factor is calculated with uh, rather, well, it's not complicated, but it's uh, a formula that involves uh, integrals. And we haven't covered that in the course, which is why I don't want to go into the details here. So you don't have to know this formula. What you have to know is, or what you should know, or what I think you should understand is how the factors influence this, uh, what kind of factors influence this value. So the form factors basically sp uh, uh, define or specify the fraction of the energy leaving one patch that arrives at the other one. So you have one patch and that sends energy, so his radiosity, Bj, to this other patch. And the amount of, or the fraction of the energy that arrives there, like I said, it is not always, not the whole energy arrives, of course, because if it is tilted, you get a different one, then, uh, or if it's further away. Uh, um, and the fraction then gives this, uh, the, the, the form factors then give this, give this fraction. And that depends, of course, like I already said, on the distance. And you see here the distance is in the image noted with R. And in the formula you see here, R to the power of two in the denominator. So if R gets larger, the form factor gets smaller. So the amount of energy that comes in is also lower, which kind of makes sense if a light source is further away, the influence on my object or on my patch is lower. Then you see you have the cosine of these two angles to each other, which basically, which model the orientation between the two patches. So you have theta i and theta j. Of course, each of the patches can be tilted. So we need two different angles here. And you see the cosine is maximum if theta is zero. So if they're straight ahead of each other, the influence is the largest. And the more you tilt them, the lower the influence gets. It's also make can also intuitively clear why why this is the case. And the other thing that influences is, is, of course, the shape of the patches. And this is the part where I don't want to go into the details. So if you're interested in it, uh, you can look up the, the references that I, that I mailed, uh, that I will put online. But uh, uh, for, for the course, you don't have to, for the exam, you don't have to know it. But uh, an integral usually covers the, uh, is a measure for the area that is covered. So this is basically, if we consider AI and AJ as the, the area, the surface of this patch, then we can make the integral over them. And then of course, it's also clear if this patch is smaller than the light that is emitted from him is has a lower influence or on the light that ar arrives on my on the other patch. All right. Um, yeah, so uh, even if you don't uh, understand the integral, you should easily see that these are symmetric because, of course, the light that comes, uh, we have two patches, so one patch sends light to, a, to, to my patch, but I, my patch also sends light to the other patch. So uh, the question is, of course, how do these form factors relate? And they are, of course, uh, symmetric in a way that you see here the right side of the equation is exactly the same in both cases. 
it's just you just have to change the order which you can without changing the result the only difference here is this ai and aj so you're dividing by the volume where you're projecting to and but if you look at this then and you see if you bring it to the other side that these are how then you see how the form factors are related to each other which is also why you sometimes if you look up a equ uh, radiosity equation you find it written like that which is basically just the other form factor than i used here here i used ij and here i used ji but then i have to multiply it of course with uh, ij divided by i a aj divided by ai and uh yeah, sometimes this, this other form is used, which uh, kind of uh, illustrates it a little better how it disp de depends on the on the shape and the surface. But uh, for 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 us, we will use uh, rather this one. And if you write it this one in a different way, that you bring this part here to the other side, and then if you look at what values we know, these are the constant values that we know. We have know the form factors because they are dependent on our scene. We know the reflectance factor, the value rho, because uh, that is dependent on the surface of the object. And of course, we know the energy because the energy is defined by the, the light sources that we put there. So the only thing that we don't know is this radiosity B. So we can write this as an equation. We have n variables, n equations, so we can write this as a linear equation system. And to solve that, we have to compute the form factors and we have to solve the linear equation system. Problem with this is it's not that easy as it looks in theory, or in practice, it's not that easy as it looks in theory. Because if you think about it, when you have what we have to do for the form factors, we have for each patch AI, we have to look for all possible AJs and that's what we have to do for each AI so what we have here is a quadratic um, this this is quadratic in the number of patches and if you heard a lecture about algorithms and uh, runtime estimation then you know that quadratic runtime behavior is not a good thing especially in a large model with a huge amount of patches so um, <clears throat> yeah that is uh, that is what I what I just said and and of course we we I didn't even talk about the the partial occlusion problem which is then uh, then uh, a special thing so it, it gets even more complicated so uh, the, but the good thing is that we don't have to solve it that way we can uh, we have, don't have to solve the integral but there is another way to do it which is called the Nusselt analog and analog because it is exactly the, uh, uh, the same way to, uh, no, it is a different way to calculate exactly the same result. And the idea is that, or he figured out that if we project a patch on a unit hemisphere that is centered around this patch we're projecting to, and then we project the projected area orthographically to the hemisphere based, to the, the hemisphere's unit based circle, then we can just take these two areas and divide them to each other and then we have the value of our patch. Now that sounds very complicated but if you look at the image you see that this is actually quite simple. Um, we have a patch AI here where we want to project to. So this is our patch we want to project to or here AI. We have a patch AJ and we want to now know the radiosity of patch AJ that arrives at AI. And to do that, we draw a unit hemisphere around AI. So this here is our, this circle here is our, our half circle or half sphere and the bottom is our unit sphere. Then we project this onto a unit sphere, which is the yellow line here or the yellow surface here. And then we project this projected area orthographically to the circle at the bottom. And then we get an area A, and if we divide that A by the area of the circle, uh, the, the, the surface, uh, the, the area of the circle of the unit sphere, then 
we have our patch, uh, our form factor for the radiosity from B J to A I. So uh, this is an, uh, like I said, an anal analogous uh, approach. So it uh, produces exactly the same result. But of course, doing a projection onto a sphere is still a lot of calculation. Um, and this is why in practice often an approximation to it is used where we project onto a cube and not onto a sphere. So this is not exactly the same. This is more, uh, this is an approximation. But you see here, if you look at one direction, what the patch sees when you have a sphere or when you have a unit cube, uh, when you have a, a, a hemi cube, it is uh, pretty much the same, which is why it produces pretty much the same results. Good. And uh, so if we can do this also with, with a cube, um, but if you do it with a cube, you have to also consider for each cell, you have to consider a different weight that contributes in a different way to kind of make up for the fact that the cube is not uh, round shaped like a sphere. So the influence of the, of the, of the small uh, grids that you have here are a little different. Um, I did not put it here because I don't want to go into the details because I'm also not asking you for, for the exam to know, to know these details. Like I said, we will not ask you, for example, for this complex formula, but you should understand the idea of it. And if I ask, for example, if I present you the formula and say, where is where is cons how is it, uh, do you see from the formula that the distance from the patches is considered and you should be able to tell me, okay, yeah, the distance R is here in the denominator. So if it is further away, we see that the, the form factor gets lower. So this is the kind of thing we want. And for the people who are interested in the mathematics behind it, they uh, are welcome to look up then the, the references. So the important thing here is that the Hemicube can be in implemented in uh, standard graphics hardware which is uh, of course important because as I said already, uh, remember that the number of form factors is quadratic in the number of patches, um, which results in a long uh, calculation time, but also um, so usually with, especially with a very large model, we do not store the model, but we recompute it on the fly. And then of course, uh, time is a big issue. Now, uh, Yeah, so we can compute the form factors now. So all we have to do now is to solve the linear equation system. But again, this is uh, quite expensive and which is why in practice also here, uh, usually you don't do that, but you use an approximation method. So, uh, and this approximation method is uh, basically the same as I used in the initial example to give you an, a, a basic uh, understanding and I uh, explain the basic idea of radiosity. We initialize every patch with the energy, with the initial energy that he ex, uh, that he uh, emits, and then in the first round for every patch we calculate the energy that comes in, and then we have, like we have in the initial image, the first image where we saw the patches on the floor were highlighted, but nothing else was highlighted. So, for example, the ceiling was completely dark. But because we have more light in after the first step now, of course, these patches also reflect light. So we repeat the previous step and add the new light that comes in. And then we do this, we repeat this until we are satisfied with the result or until we have reached a certain uh, threshold that we pre-specified. So this is pretty much the, the original uh, basic idea that I explained. But now you know also the mathematics behind it and know how to calculate it. Good, another... Uh, approximation or, or heuristic that we're using is related to this uh, separation into patches. Because of course you can imagine that uh, the more patches you have, the finer you make the grid on your model, the more realistic the results get. But of course also the more patches you have, the more you have to calculate. So the slower it gets. So there is a, a trade-off between uh, processing speed and, and uh, accuracy of the result. Um, and the, the, the heuristic here is to do this meshing not in a strict uh, uh, uniform way, but do it adaptive by so-called adaptive subdivision, where you start with a very coarse subdivision first, and then you compare neighboring uh, patches, and if the radiosity of those differs too much, 
you split them up and then uh, you calculate the radiosities for the split up models and then you do again a check if they differ too much from the neighbors you uh, split them up again until you reach a certain threshold or until uh, nothing changes anymore. Um, this uh, again becomes uh, it's pretty simple when you look at it from an example. If you look at this initial patch here on the, on the wall, yeah, that, that you can see, um, then in the first step, you would split that into two patches. And then if you compare the radiosity of this one, B1 with B2, you will see that there is a huge difference. So what you do is you split those up again and then again you compare the radiosity of the neighbors and then you see for example that these two here are half actually quite simple uh, which should probably have a relative uh, a similar radiosity actually the image is not really correct because if you look here the difference would be larger so most likely this would be also split in our algorithm and but then in the next step these here at the top would not be split anymore because here, for these four top four here, the neighbors all have a relatively similar, should have all a relatively similar radiosity. So they will probably not be split anymore. But the ones at the bottom here, or maybe this one also not, but definitely these two here also have a radiosity that is different from the neighbors. So they would be most likely be split in our, our algorithm. And that way, of course, you can, it's clear that you can create an adaptive subdivision of the space and then you have the granularity for a high quality rendering of your, of your global lighting where you need it and the parts where nothing much changes, uh, you don't have to put in much calculation time. Good. Um, yeah, and then, uh, Finally, if we want to, uh, if we have calculated this, then uh, like I said, we can consider this global illumination in our, our other lighting. So for example, we can use it together with the Guro shading at the vertices. Um, next uh, week we will talk about ray tracing and for ray tracing we'll also see that we can use it as an ambient, uh, as a global illumination technique. Um, and also, I also said that this is, of course, not real-time, so it's not used for real-time games or graphics, for example, uh, for real-time graphics, like games, for example. Um, but if we have a static scene, where static in terms of the light, that the light doesn't, sh the global light doesn't change, then we can use this, of course, in also in real-time by pre-calculating the global light and then considering it in our real-time light calculations. All right. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's about it, what I want to talk about, about global illumination. Are there any questions about this? No? Then we make a 15 minutes break and then we talk about shadows.